welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the really big ideas and the humans behind them that are shaping our world, inspiring future creation, and just for anyone that really likes good stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this journey. Um, so the last several shows, we've been spending time at you know, what we call the different hierarchical levels of the aging process, speaking to a broad range of experts in the fields of both therapeutic and preventative interventions as it pertains to both the uh, diseases of aging and the underlying processes of aging. Now, one area that has, you know, we have not yet covered, but which has really gotten extremely hot from a, a clinical translation perspective in recent years is that of senolytics. Um, just for the general audience, senescence is a, uh, a process by which our cells, due to a range of internal and external stresses and perturbations, uh, stop dividing irreversibly and enter a state of permanent growth arrest. Uh, this can be caused by xenobiotics, random DNA damage, toxins, whatever. The normal purpose of this process, the rest, is to make sure that those damaged cells don't maintain themselves any longer than they need to, and those damaged genomes are removed from the organism. Uh, then via a, a range of uh, biologic signals, uh, known collectively as your senescent associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, uh, they're set up for selective elimination via apoptosis, uh, stimulated from other cells in the microenvironment or circulating immune cells. Uh, a senolytic, uh, which comes from the combination of senescence and lytic for destroying, uh, represents a class of therapeutic substances, uh, some are drugs, biologics, maybe gene therapies, which are being developed to see if it's possible to selectively induce and enhance the elimination of these cells from the body. The core thinking as it pertains to aging is that as we get older, the elimination of these cells is slowed down for various reasons, SASP secretions become detrimental to the surrounding tissues and sets off this self-perpetuating cascade of other problems, inflammation, tissue damage, degeneration, cancer, uh, hence speeding up the aging process. So we're gonna see in the coming years whether this strategy of increasing their elimination uh, impacts the progression and reversion of human diseases uh, and hence healthy aging. Um, Today's guest, who I'm extremely excited uh, to have here, who's really at the epicenter of this space and is really thinking quite broadly in a sort of a systems way about how to deal with this issue, is going to take us further into the theme, is Dr. Peter de Kaiser. Uh, he is an assistant professor at the Center of Molecular Medicine, uh, University Medical Center at Utrecht, uh, and he focuses on senescence in both cancer and aging. Uh, Peter obtained his PhD in 2009 uh, from Utrecht on the regulation of 4 box or FOXO proteins uh, under stress and the role in tumor suppression. Uh, he spent some time uh, at the Buck Institute uh, in Novato uh, working with uh, Judy Campisi, uh, where he focused on the molecular regulation of senescence, uh, looking at heterogeneity, uh, and was involved in, in integrally generating the first and second generation of compounds uh, focusing on senescent el elimination. Uh, in 2012, Peter joined the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, where he worked on designing a third generation of antisenescent drugs, the, uh, the FOXO4-DRI peptides, which we'll hear about a little later on, uh, which were extremely effective in animal studies and counteracting signs of uh, chemotoxicity and restoring health span uh, in both accelerated and normal aging. And recently, uh, he has you know, stepped into the realm of entrepreneur and forming his own biotech company called Cliara to continue to focus on therapeutic development in this space. And, and that's very exciting as well. And we'll know more about that. Uh, all that being said, thanks, Peter, for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Very exciting. Uh, so just to start out, uh, I want to give you the floor. Can you just, for people that don't know you outside of uh, sort of the longevity community, just tell us about yourself, where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in science, uh, and then what led you into this particular uh, discipline, which is so exciting and hot nowadays. Sure. So, yeah, I think my, my, my interest in biology started at age 16 in high school. And uh, uh, when we started, you know, in, back in the 90s, we didn't know a whole lot about molecular biology, I guess. And uh, I remember that the first classes were on the mitochondria, of course, in, uh, in cell biology. And that, that struck me as something, you know, I was always very much interested in, uh, in working with uh, structures. And this was the first time I got into touch with structures inside a living organism. So that's what my, uh, triggered my interest in biology. And then I went to study here in Utrecht. I did my, uh, my internships in Boston because I wanted to really step out of uh, my own comfort zone. 
and and then you know that's uh, when I start being introduced into the American spirit of uh, doing things, I guess, working hard and uh, publishing a lot of things. And then I wanted to go back to uh, to where I grew up because I, I did have it in me to do a whole PhD there, um, but then I still wanted to go back. So as a postdoc, in the, like you said. I dragged my wife to the United States to do postdoc in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. So I've, I've seen both the East Coast and the West Coast, a very different uh, way of doing things. Oh, yeah. And which is very different from the European way of doing things. And um, I was just, was just very fascinated already during my PhD work um, in the aging process, which at the time was, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of molecular work in the aging world. It was, so I did my PhD actually in cancer biology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of molecular uh, breakthroughs were in cancer biology. Um, but then I want to apply them to, to aging, which at the time, like I said, there was not a whole lot of uh, yeah, molecular biology going on. So I was interested in senescence. At the time, 2008, uh, everybody was trying to induce senescence, I guess, in cancer cells and a uh, tumor suppressive mechanism. Um, and I got interested in, at the time, it was also people to find out that senescent cells secrete. So there's this secretory phenotype, the SASP. And I want to know, actually, uh, can you blunt this phenotype and thereby maybe, you know, counter cancer progression? And it turned out that a lot of these uh, SAS factors have these FOXO binding sites in their promoter regions. So one of the first things I did was to basically remove this FOXO protein that I had worked on during my PhD, and the cells died. So initially, there was the end of the POSA project. So I had to actually be creative, come up with new projects. But then we found out that senescent cells are anyway drivers of aging. So we said, hey, if that's true, we may have actually something that's therapeutically applicable. You know, we can mess with the FOXO signaling and maybe eliminate these senescent cells. So, um, yeah, that then at the time, because FOXO is a transcription factor, and everybody told me, well, forget it. That's also the end of your project. You cannot drug transcription factors because they are uh, unstructured. So you cannot, they don't have an ATP pocket, so you cannot make a kinase inhibitor, for instance. So I, I said, okay, I'll try it anyway. I'll, I'll try to make a peptide, uh, a self-penetrating peptide. Um, and then the first two generations were mildly effective, actually, against these senescent cells. So then, indeed, uh, I tried something which was very an ancient technology, which is called deretroinversification. It was found out in the 1990s, where you essentially, if you have a, amino acids there, by nature, they are in an L uh, isoform. Mm -hmm. And then they can also make them D. So uh, in Dutch, we call them left turning and right turning uh, milk, sure. for instance, we had in the 90s. So uh, it's a little bit of chemistry here. On the, but, but yeah, I applied this trick to my peptide. So I basically mirrored the whole sequence, flipped it, and inverted the individual amino acids. And if we did that, then this peptide became quite potent in um, killing these senescent cells. Um, and this was uh, in total like eight years of work, uh, which we just summarized uh, in, uh, in tw two minutes, I guess. Um, but that's how it goes. And then uh, in Rotterdam, indeed, we went to the mice with that, and you already highlighted it. We had some nice successes there. So now we want to actually, so I, when I went did my postdoc, I got affected a little bit with the uh, Silicon Valley way of thinking of not just trying to publish your data, mm -hmm. trying to translate them to society as well which you know in Europe I grew up with the attitude of industry is evil let's say like academia shall be free of conflict and therefore you do pure fundamental science um, but then I noticed like in the Bay Area that a lot, a lot of the PIs had their own companies and that was not, was not evil at all they were actually doing things that were great for society so I it really changed my mind so I said I have to introduce this uh, you know in the Netherlands and that's what I did. So I found my own biotech company because I really want to get these drugs into patients. So if you want to do this in the most ethical way, legal way, because of course there's all sorts of ways of uh, giving people drugs if, if needed, uh, be, uh, you know, under the counter. And that's what's happening in the US a lot at the moment. I think that a lot of people are trying things on themselves uh, without any, any supervision. And I'm against that. So what is then the legal way? What's then the, the right way of doing this? So you have to go to clinical trials. To do that, you need a lot of money. To do that, you need patents. So you need to basically get your own company. So I said, okay, then that's what I will do. I'll take the lead in, uh, in, in setting up a company myself. And, and around the same time that I was trying to do this, we got in touch with um, uh, people who at that time were the only uh, venture capital uh, investor crazy enough to invest in aging because uh, aging was considered like, yeah, it's, it's nothing. It's not like a, uh, a tangible thing. So Apollo Ventures was our uh, partner in crime. It didn't exist at the time in 2016 when we started talking. 
So they didn't even know whether they wanted to be able to raise funds. And they actually were able to raise a lot of money because I think aging is now becoming more and more acknowledged as a, the root of a lot of evil, right? So mm -hmm. diseases, uh, you don't get them when you're 25 usually. So aging itself may be targetable. So in 2017, they started the fund and then we were their first company uh, that they funded actually here in Europe. So in the, in the aging space, at least in the senescent space, we are the only European one that's been mm -hmm. funded. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find that itself already quite uh, exciting that we can be an example, hopefully, for, uh, for others. Uh, Absolutely. Is, we've got this great academic science here in the aging space. Yeah, and we hope um, you know, that by the end of uh, next year, we are now, we took a step back. So we are, we are now working on the fourth generation and the fifth generation drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, we just finished the fourth and we're going towards the fifth generation, which now becomes more chemical. So we are, it's no longer a natural product. It's now becoming more chemically modified, non-natural amino acids. And that's then the clinical candidate. And we hope that we can finish the IND, pre-IND package end of this year. And then uh, starting point, end of 2020, we hope to go for phase one trials um, with these anti senescence compounds. Excellent. Initially, it will be probably for cancer. Um, because, well, I always say what makes a cell senescent, senescent that is irreparable damage, which cells are also oftentimes irreparably damaged. That's uh, some chemo, uh, some cells that, cancer cells that received chemotherapy but didn't die from it. Right. So chemo resistant cells, cancer cells can develop the senescence biomarkers that we need for our drugs to be effective. So that will be our, uh, yeah. You know, that, that's, uh, it's extremely sad. I want, to, I want to actually spend some time on each of these, but I think in general, the, the, um, the fact that you took science, entrepreneurship, innovative thinking, you put it all together and you're doing good. <laughs> there's nothing evil about it um, because there's literally millions and millions of people that are dying every year and uh, you're clearly at the epicenter of a major driver of all of that. Um, so just going back now for a, a, a couple different questions at different levels of what you talked about, and this is a great because I want to get into all this. Um, just going back to senescence in general, you know, um, we talk, you know, about sort of early life senescence um, that you know, occurs during our development, uh, extremely important for embryonic and fetal tissue patterning. You know, if we didn't have senescence then, we wouldn't form technically. Uh, you pointed out the importance of it in tumor suppression uh, throughout our early life and, and certain aspects of wound healing. Um, however, you know, as, as the theme goes, something goes wrong um, in the senescence narrative. Um, and the system very badly gets hijacked in the sense that, okay, now we have these zombie renegade cells, they have forgotten how to die, and they're setting off a very bad cascade of stuff. Uh, just in your opinion, because I, I, don't, I don't know if there's an answer to this, but what is the core issue that makes everything go in such a bad direction, where you have this sort of elegant process of senescence that's doing us so much good, and then all of a sudden it's doing us a lot of bad? Is, right. Is there a specific thing that you look at there that say, aha, uh, <laughs> this is the main issue that has taken it and run away with it in the wrong direction? I, I think it's all about acute versus chronic, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I always talk about it as a, let's say, a drug addiction. If you take some uh, you know, illegal substance and then maybe one time it's great, mm -hmm. at some point you become, uh, you, your body requires it and you need higher and higher and higher doses to get the same kick. I think it's the same with senescence. Like a lot of the things that senescent cells secrete are beneficial mm -hmm. if they are acute uh, and for a short period of time. So in wound healing, you know, when the, if the wound closes within 12 days, then, uh, then the inflammation response also goes away because of the immune system destroying the senescent cells, let's say, mm -hmm. and that's good. But during aging, we see more and more senescent cells in, in, in every tissue. So then you get a chronic low level uh, of inflammation. So, you know, some people call this inflammaging. I, I like the definition of it. And I think senescent cells are a main driver of inflammaging. So because there is a chronic low level of, let's say, annoyance, uh, noise, if you will, uh, you need higher doses in the acute setting. Okay. And I think that's the real problem. And um, of course, um, there's another thing 
um, because those signals tell neighboring cells to change their state. For instance, and we, we discussed it already offline, the, the stem lock model, for instance, huh? if right. you have a senescent cell, it secretes factors that make neighboring cells more stem-like. Um, and this is by markers, so it's very difficult to do functional assays there, of course. But um, if this happens in an acute setting, that's nice, because let's say there's a wound, the senescent cell tells the neighboring cells to become more stem-like, and those can then differentiate and, and, and aid in tissue rejuvenation. But if you now have chronic senescent cells that, that continuously tell the neighboring cells to remain stem-like, they won't rejuvenate anymore because they, the senescent cells continuously tell that cell, you shall not divide and you shall not differentiate, you, you shall remain stem-like. So the chronic signaling to the environment has a persistent yeah, alteration uh, at a cellular level, induces a persistent alteration at a cellular level, and that's deleterious. That's, I think, one of the main drivers of aging. In the end. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and leaping off of that, because you, know, you, you publish uh, on your senescent stem lock model, which is very elegant. Um, can you talk a little bit about that further in the sense of um, the, how that may vary uh, in different tissues in the sense, you know, there's certain tissues that, you know, maintain some type of regenerative niche, in your liver, a little bit in your right. kidney versus stuff like the central nervous system, cartilage, whatever, which is extremely recalcitrant to regeneration. Um, how that may be varying and then do you foresee sort of interesting uh you know polytherapies that combine senolytics with other regenerative dynamics to enhance you know uh, regeneration as opposed to just senescence gone regeneration happening uh could we to touch on that so i think that is spot on i mean the, the field has just scratched the surface there we have not at all combined uh, let's say in my case with the destroyers, if you will, like we remove things mm -hmm. and the whole field of regeneration that tries to build things and they have never really been combined. So I think that should be for the coming years, uh, the goal of both fields to see if we can integrate uh, the two. Um, there are definitely uh, big differences, of course, in, uh, in rejuvenation potential, even at old age. Mm -hmm. The intestine doesn't really seem to age very much because mm -hmm. the turnover is so high, you have 48 hours, and then you have an uh, entirely new, new lining of your, uh, of your intestine. The idea is that even if there is damage in the intestine, uh, it goes to the daughter cells uh, upon cell cycle division, and 48 hours, those daughter cells are anyway destroyed. Mm -hmm. So there will never really be any senescent response. Liver, however, for instance, does age and does show a lot of senescence during aging, mm -hmm. simply because the daughter cells don't die, they remain there. And indeed, during aging, liver, especially also kidney, is definitely an organ where uh, the turnover is quite low, and therefore damage remains, builds up, can form senescent cells, and therefore uh, there's aging in those tissues, for instance. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah. And I think now what we're trying to do is can we make a therapy that combines both? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, our anti senescence drugs, they work on FOXO P53. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that if you remove uh, P53 from FOXO, now FOXO can go to beta catenin, and beta catenin is a driver of stemness. So, the idea is actually FOXO inhibiting beta catenin response. So, basically, you uh, you blunt the stemness response. So, one therapy could potentially, in senescent cells, kill them. And the neighboring cells kickstart the differentiation process. So then you would have like a, a one two knockout benefit, if you will. So that is the goal. And uh, of course, like I said, we're only scratching the surface there. So um, this future will tell. <laughs> that's no, that, that's a, that's extremely exciting. And especially in, in this area with more systems thinking that you're already sort of taking those steps and you're, you're thinking several generations ahead of these. Right interventions is uh, i mean i think you're, <laughs> you're 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 far ahead of the curve um coming back to the topic of cancer now because you know you mentioned sort of the you know you've published in the past uh, very interesting papers on senolytics as part of sort of chemotoxicity prevention process um i was i had a I did a show a few weeks ago here in philly uh at the worcester institute uh you know talking about you know as good as sort of some of these new smart drugs are getting at the end of the day, 
they're extremely expensive and they are only working in very small populations. And we still have, you know, millions of cancer patients with more traditional therapies and chemotoxicity. Um, you know, I don't know the exact, but it's, it's a still a major issue in 2019 as it was yeah. 50, 60 years ago. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, Semilix in relation to chemotoxicity prevention? And then also, are there specific, and any of this is confidential, you don't have to go into it, but are there specific cancers uh, that you're studying in, in the models in the lab nowadays that uh, you're more excited about than others that, that might be first uh, step? I, I'm thinking of all this with the concept that there's a huge industry, not just in oncology, but in what we'll call adjuvant oncology technologies, where you know it's not a kill event, but it is some type of other event, whether it's reprogramming or, in this case, cleaning up senescence, that is uh, predicted to be huge <laughs> and moving yeah. forward. So can you talk a little bit about that and some of the things you're doing at Cliara and, and in the lab? So, so I have, for the chemotoxicity part, I have to credit a colleague of mine, Marco De Maria, who really found that if you, uh, in a genetic model, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a model that he made where you have a kill switch that you can use to eliminate senescent cells, so not with a drug, but it's basically you can flip the switch. And he, he was the first to show that if you do this in a model of mice where that received various types of chemotherapy, that the mice were doing better. And he, t he him and I together actually are in Clara. So his uh, focus is made mostly on the chemotoxicity part in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, whereas mine was mostly on the drug development. So I tried to do with drugs what he did with the kill switch, let's sure. say. Um, I think it, would, it, it almost sounds too good to be true. You have a drug that works both against the tumor and also against the senescence that gives the toxicity. So it is, the, it is what we see, however. The chemotherapy gives senescence in liver and lung and actually enforces, for instance, uh, the tumor cells to migrate there. So actually, ironically speaking, if you give chemotherapy, you see sometimes an elevation in metastatic spread to distant organs. And if you now remove the, the senescent cells, I, it, first of all, the liver becomes more uh, you know, healthy again, becomes healthier again, and you get a reduction in metastases. So it seems you have a, a benefit on two fronts because the patients die from the metastases, usually. Now this becomes less and the tissue becomes healthier. So that is yeah, what the genetic models show. Is it too good to be true? It sounds too good to be true, but we'll have to see if we can actually do this with drugs. I mean, it would be fantastic. You basically you kill the tumor and you don't get uh, the toxic effects from the chemotherapy. So now, again, it's another one-to knockout model. Well, actually, we call this a yo-yo model. So first you give the chemotherapy, senescence therapy, chemotherapy, senescence therapy, right? It's really like, uh, and you can keep this forever. Sure. We actually see in our case that the chemotherapy surviving cells become very senescence-like. Mm -hmm. And then our drugs work very well. And then, of course, when they become resistant to our drugs, they basically become sensitive again to the chemotherapy. So there you go. At some point, arguably, you can go back and forth, back and forth. That's, that's really where I think the field will be going in the future. Yeah. I, I like that. I like the yo-yo like model. <laughs> I like that analogy a lot. Um, just one, one other question before we get into uh, to our, the wrap-up um, component. Um, another major part of your, your lab um, is, is focused on heterogeneity of senescence. Right. Yeah. Um, and this interesting parallel between, you know, today we understand that, the, you know, uh, uh, there are these imbalances. We see a mutation in uh, of some type that yields many different cancers. We see one cancer with many different mutations, um, and and we understand cancer to be this not this homogeneous thing that we thought it was, but a much more heterogeneous disease. You've yeah. talked a lot about in your research about potential heterogeneity and senescence. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and sort of do you foresee you know Cliara developing a suite of um, drugs for different senescent uh, dynamics, that's heterogeneity, and having sort of maybe a, a senescence port and a senolytic portfolio of sorts. Um, where, where are we going with all that? Yeah, I think uh, you're spot on. I think we always talk about senescence, uh, first of all, as if we understand what are the, the what is senescence, and uh, as if it's one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think I literally said that quote: "There is no such thing as senescence. There are various subtypes, and you can there are markers which are most you know, which are almost always true in the case like for P16 or lemon B1 loss.
But then there are a lot of markers which are sometimes true. And initially it was thought that this was just noise, like transcriptional mm -hmm. uh, changes or temporal changes. And that's not true. We find there actually are signatures. So there are some uh, SASP, so secreted factors, which are always associated with a molecular pathway that underlies it. So a DNA damage pathway driving more like an, uh, an inter interleukin-like uh, uh, senescence phenotype. And then you can say, okay, why, why bother? Well, this is directly relevant for the diseases that we want to uh, treat. For instance, interleukin-6 is very important in cancer progression and a ton of age-related diseases. Whereas metalloproteases are very much important for instance, aneurysms, and interleukins are not at all important in, in, in aneurysms. So once you have your, once you know that the type of age-related disease you want to tackle, then you can say you have senescent subtype A, therefore you get treatment A. But you have a different disease, so you have subtype B, you get treatment B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we are now trying to figure out which, let's say, top five senescent subtypes exist. And then there's, for instance, a thing called early versus deep senescence. Uh, so deep senescent cells are a totally different phenotype. Um, and they actually drive totally other diseases. So again, if you, once you know which top five there are, can you, make, can you find out what are the weakest links in those five pathways and then make new drugs that nobody even thought of yet to be much more specific with the benefit. Right now, a lot of our competitors, for instance, they, they make golden bullets, as I call them. Right. Like they, tar they target all senescent cells and then cure all diseases. But I don't think that's the way to go because probably you get a lot of toxicity as well. For instance, the BCL inhibitors work very well, also in my hands, but you know you get a lot of old target effects. Sure. They blow up the platelets, etc., because BCLs are in every cell. The FOXO proteins are, and the P3, activated P53 proteins are definitely not in all cells. Mm -hmm. And our drugs already require FOXO P53, high inflammation, high reactive oxygen species. So that's really a niche. It's a niche of senescent cells. So it's a niche of a niche. So the benefit is that we are very clean in that regard. You know, there's not many cells that have these requirements. So the splash damage will be much less than if you have a golden bullet. So I think for the field, it would be great if we can actually work together there in getting a better definition about heterogeneity, what subtypes exist, make specific, you know, senescent subtype drugs. And that is actually where also clear is a big part of an, an, uh, an international consortium that solely, that, that largely focuses on this, on trying to figure out what are the molecular drivers of senescence heterogeneity. And then, of course, Clara will make the drugs. So that's the, that's the, the industrial component of it all. And the academic component is figuring out why are these subtypes there and why is it not all the same? So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. It's very exciting. It's extremely exciting. Uh, before, before we wrap up, um, as I told you before, uh, we, we, we typically give the show move, put the science aside, and we go into science fiction for a moment. Um, I am going to let you, Dr. Peter de Kaiser, travel in my uh, imaginary time machine over here, uh, anywhere you want to go. Uh, you can go to the past, you can go to the future, you can talk to anyone you want, uh, meet one person and have one conversation. Uh, de Kaiser, who, who do you want to meet and what do you want to talk to them about? You know, actually, a book that I have uh, on my shelf that actually is a uh, motivator for me, it's, uh, it's this one, actually. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, John Kennedy. Actually, um, okay, it's an inspiration for me. It's uh, he has uh, this quote: "says uh, Courage is the um, is the greatest of all virtues." And he says, "Actually, I don't work in teams that are necessarily the best. I always work with the people that have the greatest passion and there to go against the you know, going against the stream, if you will." So, aging, of course, for a very very long time was looked down upon uh, in the field of science. Also, actually, I've, I've I for my I I think I've always been told that what I do will never work. So for instance, senescent cells are not important in aging. FOXO uh, is not important in senescent. Uh, FOXOs are transcription factors. You cannot drug them. If you can drug them, it definitely cannot be done with peptides. Peptides are notoriously bad drugs and they must be toxic. You know, it's always like a massive amount of skepticism. So I surrounded myself with believers and people who dare to step out and, uh, you know, frankly put, I, uh, I was motivated by this book because I did my internships in Boston and then in the JFK uh, Museum, that's where I bought it. So I still have it here actually on my desk actually and I look at it every now and then. So JFK, I would like to talk to him about, let's say the Russia crisis, the Cuba crisis, if oh, you yeah. will, and how he kept his head cool and uh, yeah, that will be a good lesson for me to see how he dealt with it. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. I, I, and, you know, it's, it's funny. I joke that if, if, if you got rid of everybody in this industry that yeah. told you that what you're doing is not going to work, there's no industry. There's no one left. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to, be, there, so, you know, that, have to basically believe in what you're doing because everybody will constantly tell you you're wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's an industry full of failures that, that want to give you advice. And it's, yeah. It's, uh, oh, so, well. uh, yeah, there's some amazing peptide scientists that, uh, you know, that we just uh, didn't want to work with because they didn't really believe in it. So I, I, yeah, I, we need, I need, you know, there's another person in aging, Kevin Perot. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He, I call him my, uh, my preacher. So every now and then, actually, we were benchmates at the Buck. He was my, uh, we shared a cubicle together. And um, I was at the time, like I said, I, I was raised just in a very fundamental biology uh, way, not at all thinking about translation. And he actually told me, you have to do something with this. If it's true that you can kill senescent cells, you're actually going to be able to, to treat people. And I was only thinking about my nature papers, let's say, and about uh, getting it published. Mm -hmm. So he, for two years, preached uh, me into this direction. So he actually was a big motivator saying, you can do this. So don't believe people who say you cannot. And then combined with the with the with this, I you know it's like it's you know over the course of two three years, I, uh, yeah, it turned my uh, motivation 180 degrees. So I'm now much less interested in publishing in cell. Of course, that's the goal of my academic career, but I want to really go to the clinic. That's my big big motivation is to see if with Clara in two years we can start phase one two clinical trials. That will be the most exciting point I think uh, that I would have ever dreamed uh, dreamed about. So yeah. It sounds like you're you're definitely going to get there, uh, and, and, and be, we watch it. <laughs> so uh, once again, uh, Dr. Peter DeKaiser, uh, Assistant Professor, Center for Molecular Medicine, University Medical Center, Utrecht, also founder of Clara Biotech, uh, operating at the epicenter of aging, cancer, senescence, and clearly what is the forefront of what I'll call the senotherapeutics uh, field. Uh, thank you for everything you do. Um, I'm going to keep watching you. I, I definitely <laughs> think you're on the, the right path and you're going to get there. So uh, All right. <laughs> once again, thank you so much for it. And, and I'm, I must be, I'm really amazed about how much background knowledge you have. Uh, it's very impressive. So I would like to thank you also about uh, you know, taking the time to look into the space and doing the interview. And I think uh, if we team up with many people, we can really make a huge benefit uh, for society. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely on the right path. Thanks so much for doing this today.